So a couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife Larry and I made our way to Juan and Sarah's so that we could um, kind of have a sit down and to plan the service. And as we were sitting down, we were talking about the music and the importance of praise. And um, I asked Juan a very important and significant favor. I said, would you just please, please, please um, sing How Great Thou Art. That is my all-time favorite hymn. I've got a little wooden placard in my office um, as a reminder of his goodness and his greatness. Uh, this God that we serve, this God that we worship, that we find and has revealed himself to us in his word. Um, as you consider that song, How Great Thou Art, and the, and the lyrics, which I will echo here in a minute, um, you find an interesting verse in the book of Isaiah, a prophet that has an incredible insight and an amazing relationship with God. And in Isaiah chapter 55, he writes these words, he sa or God reading or revealing to Isaiah, God reveals these words to him. He says, Isaiah, I want you to know, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as, he, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's a profound concept if you just stop and consider and ponder the words because this is what makes God so unique and so special in our lives. And I pray that as we leave this place today that we have a different perspective of his not just his goodness but his greatness and who he really is especially as we move into this this holiday season and you find God's goodness and his greatness manifested throughout history one of the most interesting times in the bible that you find historically is about uh, 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 BC is when you find the nation of Israel at its peak, at its zenith. And the temple at that point had been built. Uh, Solomon is king. The entire planet, the entire world is making its way to Jerusalem uh, to seek this God of Solomon. This God uh, that gave this man so much wisdom. As a matter of fact, in the book of First Kings where you find the story of Solomon and the wisdom that God gave him, it says in the text that Solomon wrote some 3,000 songs, or 1,005 songs, and some 3,000 proverbs. Those proverbs, which are still in our Bible to this day, are found in two places, the book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books in all the Bible because it speaks about who God is and his goodness and his greatness. Just like the song is revealing to us. Just like the song shares with us in our hearts about who God is and his greatness. But what I also love about that book and you see it in the wisdom that God gave Solomon. It speaks of our origin. In other words, where did we come from? In the middle of the book, he speaks of our meaning. As a matter of fact, under your chairs, there's a Bible. I want you to turn there with me. Just grab that Bible from under the chair and turn to page 328 because we're going to focus on these words. We're going to look at three verses in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And by way, these Bibles that you're opening up right now, this is a gift to you from our church. Feel free to take it home. Chapter number 7 on page 328 of Ecclesiastes, we're going to see and we're going to listen to some very profound words that speak to meaning. In other words, in the first part of the book, he talks about origin. Where did we come from? In the heart, in the middle of the book, he speaks of why are we here? Meaning, and in the end, in chapter 12, he talks about destiny. Where are we going? There's a huge debate throughout the world about existence, right? We have the fatalists, you name any and every philosophy out there, it's out there. But I'm here to tell you that God created you. He created you and me for a purpose. And that's where 
meaning comes in. So if everybody's on that page with me, it's Ecclesiastes 7. And we're going to look at three verses as we consider Melissa and her life. Is it 577 in that Bible? Man, I'm way off. No, 328. Maybe you have a different Bible. <laughs> the blue Bible is in your hands. It's page 328. I'm sure. Where's David Durant? Because I said, David, I didn't have my glasses on. What page is this on? Because the print was really small. It's 328. But listen closely to the words that you find in the text. And I absolutely love these words as it relates to what we're, what, why we're gathered here today. This, and in remembering this very precious soul by the name of Melissa Ortega. And it's Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, wrote these words. He says, a good man, a good name. A good name is better than precious ointment. Stop and consider that name for a second. Melissa Ortega. And a memory instantly comes to mind. I don't know what your experience or what your relationship with her. But what's really cool is she was in our lives later on in her life. And it was a blessing to see her here. And my wife being a part of her life. And for me, when I think of that name, Melissa Ortega which is better than precious ointment, Solomon says. I think of that smile. I think of that joyous heart. I think of a, of a woman, and perhaps she was masking some deep-rooted emotional pains, but that's the woman that I came to know and to love. And Solomon, in his wisdom, speaking about the meaning of life, drives home this issue of our name being better than precious ointment. But I want you to consider the next few words in our text. And it says this, and the day of death. And this is why God's thoughts are greater than our thoughts, folks. This is what Solomon writes next. And the day of death, than the day than one's birth. Isn't that heavy? Isn't that kind of weird? You know what Solomon just said? That today is a greater day. In her life than her birth. I don't know who was present at her birth. Probably at St. Vincent's. Right Juan. Juan, my, Juan and Sarah might have been there. Definitely Aunt Carmen. Theo Juan. They were all there. But look who's here today. Look who's present today. So the more I consider life. The more I consider events in life. The more I'm reminded of the depth and the beauty of God's word. Because he reminds us of the importance and the significance of life. Three, four people at her birth. At least 150 in this room. Remembering her death. And it says this next. It is better. Now it gets really weird. It is better to be, to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. And here's why. And I love this. And this is what today is about. He says this next. For that, the, for that is the end of all men. And the living will lay it to his heart. You know why today is more significant. In God's perspective. Than our birth. Because it drives home. The importance and the significance of life. That little dash right there after the 1964. We're looking at her date of birth. And the day that she passed. That little dash is your life. It's my life. This guy had so much insight and so much perspective. That really drives home. Why we're even gathered here today. One of the most awesome things that Jesus did. In discipling and in teaching his disciples. And bringing forth revelation to them. In the gospel of John chapter 10. Where he refers to himself as the good shepherd. And that's exactly who and what he wants to be in our lives. He says to his disciples. Never forget, guys, that the thief, speaking of Satan, speaking of the adversary, he says this of him. He says, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his purpose. That's his agenda. 
That's his plan. But he draws a contrast in that verse in John 10, 10. And I love these words. And he says this next, but I have come to give you life. And listen to this. And a life more abundantly. That's what Jesus promises in this life. The abundant life. Now it begs the question, what, it, what is that? Where, does, where, does it, where is it derived? Where and how can I realize the abundant life? This is where we have to stop and be mindful of songs like How Great Thou Art. Origin. Where did we come from? Solomon drives this issue home. This is what makes the human soul and the human being so unique. David wrote in, in the Psalms that God has made you and he's made me and wonderful. You have been created and wonderfully made. Why? For the sake of just making? No, because he's got a plan. He's got a purpose for our lives. And when we lose sight and when we lose focus and we begin to focus on just the earthly and the temporal, that's when the thief comes and steals, kills and destroys. So the first thing that Solomon drives home is this whole notion of origin. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where are we going? Questions that we all and I pray that we ask just last week, just last week, we had a full moon, and man, we are so blessed to live where we live, aren't we? So, so blessed to experience the night sky that we experienced, to see the stars the way we were able to see them. And just a few days ago, we had the privilege of seeing a full moon. And I have a really cool dog. Her, she's a yellow lab, 10 years old. Her name's Maggie. She's my pal. Whenever she hears me outside, she comes and stands by my side the whole time and just like I do every once in a while, I go outside and I just start looking at stars, just kind of thinking and pondering because those things were created by him and for him. God created that, those cosmos, those stars that we see each and every night for a purpose, for a reason. He created that moon for a reason. And I looked to Maggie and I said, Maggie, look at that cool moon. And uh, she just kind of looked at me like I was nuts or crazy, which I probably sounded talking to a dog. But see, this is what separates us from the animal kingdom. Is you and I have the unique ability to step back and just ponder. And just consider his goodness and his greatness. That's why we sang that song. This is why we, we hear the songs, the words, and how great thou art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds that thy hands have made. How many of us in this room believe that he created it? I do. And it's not there just for the sake of being there. He created it for a purpose. And the answers are in this book. The answers to those questions that you and I ask each and every day are here. If we would just seek him out and we would just seek them out. Because this is where you're going to find meaning. This is where you're going to be able to move from just existing. And going beyond the question of why am I here to. to or why do I exist to why am I here. Which ultimately we answer the question, well, where am I going? Because you know what? I believe with all my heart, I know where she is. And those are his promises. And he says to us, consider all the worlds that thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. The power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Man, he's good. He's great. Ready and willing to supply, believe it or not, your every need. Not necessarily your wants, but your needs. As you get to the heart of the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon now begins to deal with the whole idea of meaning. Why am I here? In the book of James chapter 4 in the New Testament, James wrote these words. Whereas, he says, ye know not what shall be on the morrow. In other words, what he's saying to us in that verse is figure your life up because you're not promised tomorrow. 
There's not a person in this room that is it guaranteed another day or another hour or another month on this planet. We are all bound to this fallen condition, this human condition. This is why God sent his son. On that Christmas cross that we've got, which is quoting Isaiah, it says, For unto us a Savior is born. You know what God came to do? He came to save us from ourselves. And when we find him and when we seek him and when we love him and when we're intimate with him, you will find and he will reveal to you that abundant life that he promised his 12 disciples. And he speaks to us about this whole notion and this whole idea of meaning. And James writes, where and you know not what, should, what will be for tomorrow. He says next, for what is your life? Almost sounds like a soap opera. So what is your life? And then he answers his question with this amazing answer. He says, it is even a vapor. That appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Do you hear what he just called our lives? And I ran a little Google thing and I said, average life of the average life of life expectancy of the American. You know what the, our average life expectancy is? Anybody know? 78.3 years. 78.3 years. So if you are in your early 40s, half your life is gone. Some of us are on borrowed time. <laughs> I'm getting there. When was it, Larry? A couple months ago, we were in Israel, and I, I, have, I turned 60 when we were in Israel. 60 years old. You know what? I'm 80% of the way there. But he says, John, to me, John, your life is but a vapor. I went out this morning again to take care of my awesome pet and give her some water. And as I went out, I could see my breath. And as I considered my breath, I thought about this verse. I said, that's my life. Is that vapor that I just saw, that I just witnessed is my life. In the grand scheme, in the big picture. In this amazing thing called existence. I have a piece of string here. Is this string or rope? I saw Richard sitting over here, so I figured I'd hang him. Been wanting to do this forever and ever. But you know what? If I was to extend this piece of cord, it would probably go to the other side of this room. Long way away. You know what? From God's perspective, this is the next principle that we're going to consider. This white part, this is destiny. This is eternity. And you know what it does? It goes on and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. That's why it's called eternity because it's forever. But I have a piece of duct tape here on this end. You know what it says? This is your life. This is a vapor. 78.3 years right here written down. This is us. So it begs the question, what are we doing with the one life? The one vapor that God has given us. The breath that he's breathed into us. The perspective and the light that only he can share. That he, only he can shed. This is what this, this story is all about. This is what the Bible is all about. It's about his story. That's what history means. History is nothing more than his story. And you know what's so cool? He's included you in it. You know why I know that? Because you're here today. Because you're physically here. Because you have an existence. Your life and my life should have meaning and the answer to your meaning is in here that he created you and he created me for a purpose and in the letter to the ephesians which is a fascinating letter and i'm sure some of you have heard some of the passages out of ephesians but that word ephesus means this it means to be fully purposed if we want to experience Fully, full purpose, a purposeful life. This life of fulfillment that Jesus promised his disciples. You know where you're going to find a lot of those answers? In the letter to the Ephesians. And in that letter, Paul wrote some really profound words. He said to the Ephesians. For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of works. And I love this next part of the verse. It is a gift of God. 
Christmas time, huh? My wife already buying Christmas gifts. Gifts. I think she learned a few years ago not to do the whole Black Friday thing. But why do people do the Black Friday thing? You know what I'm realizing? Not so much for gifts anymore so that they could get their own deal. <laughs> right? It's amazing how people will kill each other for a 39-inch flat screen. But you know what is so awesome and so incredible about Christmas that I love and appreciate about Christmas? Is the gift that keeps on giving. And that was Jesus you know what Paul calls grace? A gift of God. And if you know anything about gifts, if we understand Christmas and the giving spirit of Christmas and what it means to give, the only thing that makes or the one thing that makes a gift yours is what? That you receive it. That you own it. That you accept it. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to offer the most incredible gift ever, his grace. Think about the word grace for a second because that word grace, G-R-A-C-E, you can convert that into an acronym. Like Steve, my brother, I worked for the government, so everything's got to have an acronym, including grace. Here's a little acronym for grace. Catch this because it's profound. It's this. It's God's riches. At Christ's expense. Did you catch that? You can experience a life of purpose and meaning and fulfillment now. Because of what Jesus Christ did on that cross. That's grace. Everybody right now together take a deep breath. Let it out. You want to hear something really profound? You guys just took a breath. But you know what's so cool about that breath? It was there waiting for you to take it. And that's God's grace. God's grace is waiting for his people to take it, for his creation to take and accept and receive his grace. And you know what's so awesome about it? It's free. There's not a thing that you and I could earn to merit salvation. This is why he died. He died because he loves you. Because he loves me. The most incredible verse, the verse that you see most quoted and most translated anywhere in the Bible is John 3.16. You know what it says? For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and then this life is where you, you're the whosoever, for whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Destiny. Destiny. You matter to him. And if we don't stop and ponder and realize like this dude, Solomon, and think about where we came from, why we're here and where we're going, then we're no different than my yellow lab. Life will never make sense because you and I, we were created by him and for him. And when we realize that and when we accept it, then it'll make sense. Then you'll find what I consider the next part of the journey, which is this whole notion of hope. A hope that only he could bring. And I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what was happening in Melissa's life at whatever point in the journey. But there's every one of us have gone through times, through seasons where we have felt hopeless, right? Hopelessness. And man, it could be despairing. It could be heavy. It could be hard. But you know what I love about this whole concept and the notion of hope? In Hebrews 6, Paul says, it's an anchor. Hope is an anchor in your life. And think about the purpose of an anchor for a second. It's going to keep that ship, it's going to keep that boat steady in the craziness of life, in the storms of life. And that hope is knowing and realizing how grace 
ultimately translate into hope. And you know what Paul calls that hope in Titus? The fact that he's going to come back someday. The fact that he's going to return. Those of us that grew up in, in, in listening to the mass. Every Sunday we heard the words. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will what? Christ will come again if we really believe that. You know what Paul calls that? He calls and refers it to as our blessed hope. But we can only experience that destiny and that eternal life. That white part of the cord. When we realize and embrace his grace. A grace that not, will not only save you, like the song implies, amazing grace that we sang. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Man, I was a wretch. If you ask my wife, I'm still a wretch. <laughs> that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's grace. That's what Jesus came to offer you. That's the abundant life. That's what he desires for us. And it comes from hope. And it comes from grace. A grace that saves and an also a grace that sustains. Because once you receive that grace, it's yours. You own that gift. So what you do with that gift... Is what's going to carry you through life. A grace that sustains. The greatest Christian that ever lived in the Bible. The Apostle Paul. Had the same struggles and the same challenges that you and I go through. In 2 Corinthians 12. Three times he begged God. Help me with this thing I'm struggling with Lord. Please I'm begging you three times. The Bible says that he cried out to God. And, he, and you know what God said to him? He said, no. Because this thing that you're dealing with, Paul, it's driving you to your knees. And in that weakness, Paul, you're going to find strength. And then Jesus says something really cool to him. You know what he says to him next? Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. It'll sustain you. It'll keep you. Those tough and dark times, they are inevitable. But I'm telling you, man, our grace, our source of grace and our hope has to be in Jesus Christ. So in closing, these are the words of the Apostle Paul to this young man, Titus. He says, for the grace of God that bringeth forth salvation hath appeared, listen to this, hath appeared to all men. It's there for anybody's taking. For all, all of us, for God so loved the world, that's all of us, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's individual, will believe it in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's grace. And he says this next. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, folks, we just got back from Israel. There is some crazy stuff happening on this planet. He's coming back. He's coming back. Where did you come from? Why are you here? And where are you going? One of my all-time favorite movies. My brother-in-law Dale was with my office. And we, I have a helmet in there. A, a Roman helmet. A gladiator helmet. I love the movie The Gladiator. Maximus the Spaniard is my hero. If you guys remember at the beginning of the movie. As they were getting ready to attack those German barbaric hordes. He takes his cavalry up to the backside of the mountain as they were going to do in a, a flanking maneuver on those, on those barbarians. And he brings his troops together and he says to them, kind of in jest, hey, yeah, hey guys, if you find yourself walking through green fields with the sun in your face, he says, do not be troubled for you are in Elysium. That was the Roman concept of heaven. 
In other words, you're dead. So don't freak out. And then he says something really profound in that same, in that same thought, in that same thing. You know what he says next? He says, never, ever forget, men, that what you do in this life will what? Will echo through eternity. Will echo through eternity. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your son, Jesus, who, Lord, is the giver of grace, who is our blessed hope, who is the great and mighty God. And, Lord, we gather here above all else to worship you, to glorify you, Lord. And, Lord, we're using this life well lived, this precious soul, our sister, our cousin, our loved one, Melissa, for the sole purpose of honoring you today. And Lord, as she sits in your comforting arms, even now, Lord, I pray that as she looks down on this place, as you hold her in your precious arms, that you and her could say and look down, Lord Jesus, how you are glorified through her life. Thank you, Lord, for our time together here today. Be with us now as we conclude the service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One. Thought of Dante's Paradiso and his imagination of what heaven might be like. And this is what I, I want to believe Melissa has experienced. So now, appearing to me in the form of a white rose was heaven's sacred host, <coughs> those whom with his own blood Christ made his bride, while the, while the other host that soaring see and sing the glory of the one who stirs their love, the excellence which has made it what it is, like bees that in a single motion swarm and dip into the flowers, then return to heaven's hive where their toil turns to joy when they descended into the flower adorned with precious petals and then back then flew back up to where its source of love forever dwells their faces showed the glow of living flame their wings of gold and all the rest of them whiter than any snow that falls to earth as they entered the flower tear to tear each spread the peace and ardor of the love they gathered with their wings in flight to him nor did this screen of flying plentitude between the flower and what reigned above impede the vision of his glorious light. For God's light penetrates the universe according to the merits of each part, and there is nothing that can block its way. This unimperiled kingdom of all joy, abounding with those saints both old and new, had look and love fixed all upon one goal, O triune light, which sparkles in one star upon their sight, fulfiller of full joy, look down upon us in our tempest here. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I am Susie. For those that don't know me, I Melissa was my baby sister. And she was the baby of five of us. There were 14 years difference between Melissa and I. I prayed for a sister. I prayed hard for a sister and I was 
so thrilled. This was in the days when you didn't have those reveal parties and everybody knew what they were going to have before the baby was born. And so I used to tell my mom, because she had two miscarriages between the boys, I said, you'd lose all the girls. And when my sister was born, I was just so, so thrilled. We didn't have a telephone, so they called to my Uncle Benjamin's to let me know that I had a sister. And uh, we used to laugh because I told everybody that I had a sister that weighed 10 pounds, 7 ounces. And everybody was shocked. It was really 7 pounds, 10 ounces. But I was just so <laughs> jumbled up, and I was so excited that I jumped the wall. I said, I jumped the wall to go tell everybody what we had. Melissa was born in a time in our family when it was very difficult. My dad had been drinking, and we all needed a ray of sunshine, some new hope. And nothing brings that as much as a new baby. And we all were thrilled with her. We all, she filled a void in each of our lives. And we all kind of spoiled her. We all kind of loved her. And recently, she lived for a year and a half in Washington. And um, that's the first time that all of us had really been around her for a long time. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, looked at the relationship and she said, Mom, you mother her. She said, she needs a friend. You mother her. And I thought, and I th thought of that. Melissa was my first child. I did mother her. 14 years difference. I changed her diapers. I would help if I would. And it is so hard for me, her passing. Because it's like my first child. And when I think of Melissa, she was such a joyful, joyful child. She loved to make people laugh and intelligent. But life happens to all of us. And some things we don't control. Some things we do. And I gave my children an admonition when we had a service in Washington. And I said, beware of the choices that you make in your youth. Because some choices will follow you all the rest of your life. <coughs> there were some choices that Melissa made that have followed her all the rest of her life. And I asked that this song be played today. Because... I don't think she ever really believed what an amazing, wonderful person she was. I don't think she realized how much joy she brought to those around her. And working around people and young people, she loved young people. She would bend over backwards to try to meet their needs or whatever help she could give. That's who Melissa was. She met, she loved people, she loved music. That's how we would remember Melissa. She would meet you and even though she wasn't related to you or had known you for a long time, if you had a need, she would try to meet it. She was amazing, but she never really accepted that. The other admonition that I gave my children, older and my grandchildren, there is a familiar spirit in our family. And many of you are my cousins. 
Many of you have also dealt with the familiar spirit of addiction and alcoholism. And it gets me so, so angry that this spirit, this devil, has taken so much from my family. She is the third of my siblings to pass away because of this. I have a nephew that passed away. I have a cousin who just buried a son not long ago. The same thing. Be aware that this is a weakness. Goes long, long ways back. Teach your children. Warn your children. There is help. There is someone there for you. And I would tell Melissa, Melissa, we have seen it with my dad. That one week he went into rehab, never drank again. There's hope. There is hope. And to have faith in knowing who Jesus Christ is. To know the, the word of God and what it says. What he says about you. To believe it. To get a hold of it. And I... The last rehab that Melissa went to, 